This novel was possible because of a Patreon member request. So if you want to support this channel you can consider becoming a Patreon member to make the request like this. Or you can support this channel on PayPal or Ko-fi link in the description. And if you want to buy Google Drive link which has more than 300 plus novel audiobook then you can visit my Ko-fi account. Where you will get Google Drive link in just $20 for lifetime. Also, if you want to read an advanced chapter or want to support the author of this novel, then you can support the author. Link in description. Chapter 31, 31. First day of school. That night was very long. Magnus had a very good sleep. He had a good dream too. In it, he saw himself once again in the plains he stood once when he was lost two years ago. He found that the tree was missing from there now, but there was a small orb of light floating around. Hello, Magnus. The orb said, in a voice that Magnus recognized as it had spoken to him a few times in the past. Are you Merlin? Magnus asked, making a wild guess. Yes, and no. I am his will, I am his knowledge and I am his experience. I am here to teach you, Magnus. All I ever knew. I know, the real Merlin would have loved to meet you, but even his magic was limited and he could not trap his soul to mortal worlds without the risk of turning foul. The white orb of light spoke. So what are you going to teach me? Magnus asked excitedly. Nothing for now. You are not ready, neither for the knowledge nor for the gifts. You need to grow more first. Just memorizing a charm does not make you an expert in it practice is needed. Once, you have crossed the threshold to start facing Merlin's magic, we will meet again, until then, I am leaving behind a language that ancient people used to speak. You will know where to use it. The voice said and immediately vanished from space. Magnus felt as if he was being pulled out of a thin pipe. Ha ha. His breath was fast, and he found himself back on his bed. It was still night time. That was, a strange dream. My life is turning stranger by the day he thought to himself and finally went to sleep. Meow. Chad the fat cat poked his head up to see Magnus up. Sleep, Chad. I'm fine. He muttered and set himself in a nice comfortable sleeping position and finally slept soundly. He felt too tired to plan for the future. But, while he slept, the magical world had lost its sleep. Those in power or with motive could not sleep, those who were asleep were woken up. The news was big and crazy for them. Eugenia Jenkins, the current minister for magic, was having a sleepless night too, with so many letters and inquiries suddenly being made to her. She had customized her office to have a one-way wall so she could look at the big open lobby slash hall of the Ministry of Magic. She looked down at the giant statue from the one-way wall. She talked to her secretary, you're telling me, a descendant of Merlin has appeared? That Merlin? She asked, pointing at the giant statue down there. Yes, ma'am, this seems to be the case. The name was spoken by Professor McGonagall and then confirmed by the talking hat. It talked about the past when Merlin was a student. What should we do, ma'am? This will be huge. Jenkins was a strong-headed woman and had dealt competently with pure blood riots during squib rights marches that were going on not long ago. So, she was not going to be a weak-willed person like her predecessor Navi was. Contact Headmaster Dumbledore. I believe he must have something in his mind. Ignore all other inquiries until then. I will not speak unless we have a confirmation. I cannot and will not be a part of rumors. She sternly ordered. The news reached far and wide and immediately across the globe. But there was one particular young and rising news reporter. She liked to stay on point and do her job the best. Her name was Rita Skeeter, just two years had passed since she had completed her studies at Hogwarts. Now, she worked for Daily Profit as a freelancer and wanted to become the face of true journalism in the future. Just now, she got the story she was looking for. Something that could make or break her career. Not just her, but countless heads of different small and big houses got this news and it shocked them. But, the most shocked were not the wizards or witches. Instead, it were the goblins of Gringotts. They had been sitting on all the things left by Merlin until now with no worries of someone coming to take it. But now out of nowhere a new heir had come. Gringotts head goblin called in a big meeting with most of the management level goblins. But, in the end, it was decided that this new heir would be tested with his blood. If he passes the blood inheritance test, he will be given access to the vaults. They didn't want to mess with Merlin's descendant. It might turn them into the enemy of all wizards. Hogwitz. Um, just five more minutes, pancakes, yes. Magnus was mumbling in his sleep. Slap. He felt a hard slap on his face and he woke up quickly, with the intention to punch back. But then he saw Chad looking down at his face up close while sitting on his chest. Ah, it was you? Since when did you get so strong? What's the time? He wondered and looked at the mechanical clock on the wall. Ah, I have enough time. The class starts at 8. It's a double class of history on top of that. The ghost will be teaching us. Magnus muttered to himself. Seeing that he was alone in the dorm, he went to his suitcase and took out Arthur's portrait and set it up on top of the wall touching Magnus' bed. Ah, finally some fresh air. What kind of room are you staying in? Is this Hogwitz? Arthur asked. Yes, and we are in Slytherin's dorm. This is an underground area. He explained. I knew it. Hogwitz is a sex dungeon castle. Arthur exclaimed. Haha, yeah, sure. Say whatever you want to say to make Merlin look bad. You will be staying here now. I gotta go and get ready for the classes. He left the painting hanging there. He went out of the dorm to the common room. There, he saw a few students from different years gathered. My family is very old. They were talking about blood purity. 
But, as soon as he appeared, all of them flocked to say good morning to him. Narcissa walked up to him and said good morning too. We were talking about which student belongs to the oldest family in the school right now, who do you think it would be? She asked, obviously knowing the answer. Magnus replied as if it was so obvious, of course, it would be me. Merlin was one of the first students at Hogwarts and he was personally taught by Salazar Slytherin. And I am sure none of the families of people here is as old as that so that makes me the one belonging to the oldest family. Not to mention, Magnus Arthur heritage made his bloodline even older because Arthur was a royal and had a lineage spanning many generations. All students there nodded silently. It was indeed true. Ah, uh, let's go and eat our breakfast. Can't be late for the first class. Magnus exclaimed loudly, making everyone remember that they needed to move. Soon, Magnus also found Ragnar. When did you wake up? An hour before you. T thanks for yesterday. Those bullies came to me and apologized today. Ragnar said. Magnus patted his shoulder. Haha, don't mention it. Let's go now. They arrived at the History of Magic class. It was a joint class with Hufflepuff's first years with them. It was being taken by the ghost named Cuthbert Binns. He died somewhere in the past when he taught until a very old age, then he fell asleep in the staff room and died in slumber. Afterwards, he became a ghost who continued to teach. Magnus took a seat beside Snape, the boy had been avoiding him for a while now. Ragnar followed him. He looks very old, Ragnar exclaimed. Magnus chuckled, ha, there is a funny yet depressing story behind it. Professor Binns had been very old when he had fallen asleep and got up the next morning to teach, leaving his body behind him. Seriously, was he so dissatisfied with his life that teaching was his only pastime? Huh, this is a waste of time, Snape muttered. Magnus had noticed this habit of Snape. He would voluntarily avoid people but whenever he was around someone, he would hear them and make stupid comments, earning their ire. You know who you remind me of, Severus. Magnus spoke, directly to him. Who? Snape instinctively asked. A girl who is in one-sided love. Hesitant to confess but always trying to get attention. Magnus said. For some reason, Snape blushed, I don't have a crush on Lily. Magnus and Ragnar both turned to each other's faces and then laughed. Ha ha ha, so you do like her. Magnus exclaimed. That was like a mad witch saying I'm not mad, Ragnar commented. He was opening up very rapidly now that he was under Magnus' umbrella of protection. Okay okay, let's not pull his leg. Severus, my friend. Why are you so stiff, we are from the same house, no need to be reserved around me. And if it is about Lily, then don't worry, I'm not interested in her. Even if we forget we're eleven, I'm just not interested in redheads, my dad is a redhead and whenever I see red hair I remember him and I don't want to have my first kiss with my dad in my mind. Magnus tried to ease Snape a little. Cough. Wasn't that too much detailed? Ragnar questioned. It's all right. I'm a little shameless. Magnus shrugged. Magnus was, after all, a perfect candidate for all houses so it was obvious he was not going to be a typical Slytherin. Chapter 32, 32. Student become teacher. Okay, folks. Professor Bin seems to be asleep. I will write a letter to my mummy now, also to my best brother. Magnus muttered and started writing one piece of paper. Huh, mama's boy. Snape scoffed at him. Magnus smiled, if loving my mom and dad makes me a mama's boy, then I'm ready to get it tattooed on my forehead. He continued writing while making small talk with Ragnar. The pale-looking boy was from an ancient house that was not part of Sacred 28. His house name was Ouroboros. Ragnar spoke while looking at him right, you know, I never expected the descendant of Merlin to be so, so nice to me. Hehe, <laughs> why would you think that? Magnus asked back. Look around you, look at their faces. All of them are so prideful and arrogant. Everyone who comes to Slytherin is like that because they are from some ancient or rich family. But you, even though you are from the greatest and the oldest family, you are so friendly and nice to all. Ragnar made the observation. The talking hat said I fit in all four houses but it still sent me here. So, I guess there must be something special about me. Magnus proudly said. Maybe a little narcissistic, Ragnar added, before laughing. Within an hour, Magnus was done with his two letters. He was sending both letters in one packet addressed to his mom, she would send the letter to Bobby later. What is going on? It's been an hour and still, he hasn't started teaching. Magnus inquired. Who knows? I guess we should sleep too. Another first year Slytherin said. Magnus rubbed his chin, hmm, I think I can teach them. I know a fun story, it is true so it can be called history. He got up and went to the teacher's stage. Cough class isn't starting so I will tell you all a nice story from the history of our British magical community. I can stop if you want though. None of them said no. All expected some kind of special knowledge from him. Binns was snoring on his chair anyway. So, Magnus started, do you all know what a warlock is? Well, a warlock is a very old term that has two meanings, to describe a wizard of unusually fierce appearance or as a title denoting a particular skill or achievement. It was originally given to one learned in dueling and all martial magic or was given as a title to a wizard who had performed feats of bravery, as muggles were sometimes knighted. I will tell you the story of a warlock, Yarlith Hobart. He lived somewhere close to 1544 AD. As all of you are first years, I do not expect you to know him, well, except my friend Severus, he's very smart. Magnus said, making everyone look at Snape. Okay, once upon a time, there was one old smart wizard, he was well versed in magic, but he was obsessed with flying. 
So, he worked hard and finally developed a spell. So, on July 16, 1544, Hobart invited a large crowd of wizards, among which was the chief warlock of the Wisengamot, to witness his maiden flight in the form of a public demonstration of his own revolutionary charm on himself. He was taking a big risk by doing this but in those days, there were not many laws restricting self-experimentation. He climbed onto the roof of his local church and, after several speeches and a rousing performance of the national anthem, he leapt and, having cast the spell, was left hovering in midair. At first, he seemed to have succeeded, but, after having spent nearly three minutes watching him hanging in midair, the crowd grew impatient to see him move somewhere, and booed him. In response to the cat calls, Hobart tried to move in midair and started performing vigorous swimming movements, which produced no effect. All it looked was less majestic and more silly, but Hobart had misunderstood his own spell, believing that his clothes were making him heavier and impeding his movement, so Hobart stripped naked. Magnus stopped at this point as it was boring if he were to speak non-stop. So, fun question time. I will give you options and you will guess what happened next. Magnus suggested. All the students got a little excited hearing this. They were mostly scared of the quiz as it would embarrass them but multiple choice questions were something different. Okay, the options are. 1. He started flying faster than a sparrow. 2. He became so lightweight that he was pulled towards the sky and was never seen again. 3. He fell on Chief Warlock, breaking his neck and killing him. 4. He fell and broke his bones. Choose one option, you all he said. Okay, those who choose one, raise hands. 2, 3, and 4. He received all the answers. The most popular choices were 1 and 3. 4 was only selected by Snape, Ragnar, and another one student of Ravenclaw who was a girl. The correct answer is 4th. He fell completely naked on the ground, breaking 16 bones, and went on to receive a fine for outrageous silliness from Chief Warlock. This happened because the clothes had been charmed by the spell, not Hobart himself. Hearing that, many chuckled. Now, continuing the story, Hobart returned home, humiliated, where he realized that his spell could make objects fly for varying lengths of time, depending on the skill of the spellcaster and on the weight of the object. But he was a determined man, he would never give up so easily. So, he concluded that small animals and even children could be flown, but that they had no control whatsoever of their movement once airborne. He thus made a second announcement, and an even larger crowd gathered to see his second demonstration of the spell. Most of the people were hoping for another laugh at his expense. Even Chief Warlock came again because whatever Hobart may be, he was a talented wizard. Hobart's demonstration was, at first, by far more successful than the first, and he showed the onlookers how he could easily fly objects ranging from small rocks to fallen trees. Hobart decided that, for the finale, he would levitate the Chief Warlock's hat. Now, for round two, this time, there will be no options. Guess what happened next? Any answer is acceptable, he requested. A Slytherin boy stood up and said, he will make the Chief Warlock fly. A Hufflepuff girl also spoke, he will fail. He will make Chief Warlock's clothes fly away, turning him naked. Many guesses were made, but none hit the spot. Okay, all of you are wrong. What he managed to levitate was the chief's wig, exposing his bald head to the gathered crowd. A big round of laughter ensued after that. In the class too, they laughed while imagining that. Because many imagined this happening to Dumbledore. The chief was not amused and was determined to duel Hobart, but the warlock levitated the chief's robes over his head, and ran for it. He stayed hidden for a long time after that until he was sure that Chief Warlock had forgotten the matter. Now, what do we learn about Hobart from all this? He asked everyone. He was a fool. He was not good at magic. Magnus shook his head, man was a genius. He had accomplished the magical art of creating new spells, something a very small number of wizards can do. The spell he created was none other than what we will be learning in our charms class. Yarlith Hobart was the famous inventor of the levitation charm, an incredibly impressive magical achievement given the immense complexity, danger, and skill required in the development of spells. All this was in the history of magic book of this year that I read in my free time. Many students awed at this. This goofy story was related to something from their charms book. And unknown to Magnus, no one in this class was ever going to forget the levitation charm now. Clap clap clap. Suddenly, many claps came. Magnus turned around and looked, it was none other than the ghost of Professor Binns. Marvelous, what a wonderful lesson. Interesting as well as knowledgeable. You did an even better job than me. They all sleep usually but today they look so fresh. I knew it, Merlin's descendant cannot be an ordinary wizard. Bin spoke, showing the rare excitement on his transparent face. This was a test. Magnus inquired. Bin shook his head, it was not meant to be but it did look like that. And you passed with flying colors, Mr. Pendragon. It will be an honor for me to teach you. And for your achievement today, for just being a first year student and yet knowing all this, 50 points to Slytherin. As soon as that was announced, the Slytherin students made an uproar. The first student to contribute to Slytherin's pool of points that year was Magnus. Chapter 33, 33. Fight. The first day of school was eventful. Magnus and Ragnar did pretty well in their classes. But, on day one he found out what he was good at what not. And it seriously disappointed him a little. The second class of the day was Transfiguration. Monday was the busiest day for all students and teachers as the schedule was jam-packed. In this class, Professor McGonagall taught them the theory behind the Transfiguration first. 
It turns out, there was a mathematical formula behind this and Magnus was best at maths. The transformation formula said that the intended transformation is directly influenced by body weight, A, viciousness, V, wand power, W, concentration, C, and a fifth unknown variable, Z. The meant that T, transfiguration, was equal to wand power, W, X concentration, C, then all of it divided by viciousness, V, X body weight, A, and all of it was then multiplied by the fifth unknown variable, Z. Now, what the unknown variable was nobody knew. Magnus had noticed that in all these years, all the wizards and witches had researched to perfect their magic, make new spells and power up methods, but none of them researched the origin of it. Why does magic exist? No one could answer this question of his. They only know that like humans, magic originated in Africa. But, one thing was sure to Magnus, that magic followed the laws of physics. For example, the conservation of matter and energy. But then there were instances when these laws could be broken by extremely strong wizards and that was what he was aiming to achieve. But, for now, his 11-year-old little body couldn't dream of doing that. There were many branches in transfiguration and Professor McGonagall had warned them that it was also dangerous. Transfiguration is some of the most complex and dangerous magic you will learn at Hogwarts. Anyone messing around in my class will leave and not come back. You have been warned was what she said. The first task of all of them was to turn a match into a needle. This was considered the simplest of all transfiguration spells. Ragnar, just watch me and learn. Magnus proudly said. But I've already done it, Ragnar suddenly replied. Magnus, in shock, turned to him, and there was indeed a silver needle in front of him. Ha, so you're talented in it. Okay, you made it silver, I will make it gold, I like gold anyway. Magnus proudly claimed. A slash n, incantation is unknown for this magic so I am making one. Need leafy. Yes, yes, turn into a needle. He muttered as the matchstick was being turned. He had kept the concentration aspect in his mind, imagination was also a major part. It finally took the shape of a needle and turned golden. But, shockingly, it turned into a bigger size than what the original matchstick was. Quickly, Professor McGonagall appeared. She had stars in her eyes but kept a serious face. Perfect, even better than I expected. Making it even larger than the original size is something not all wizards can do, Mr. Pendragon. And Mr. Ouroboros, amazing on your part too, on your first attempt to do it. Ten points to Slytherin. Professor McGonagall announced and went on her way. She could not overly praise someone as it would discourage others. I think we are going to win the house cup just by gathering these points. Magnus talked to Ragnar. Hee hee, there is still the quid ditch. But, I'm not interested in it. I hate flying. Ragnar said distastefully. But I want to do it. I know I'm gonna love it. Okay, let's help the others. Look, Snape did it too. Magnus exclaimed. Why does he try to avoid us? We never said anything bad to him, Ragnar questioned. Magnus sighed, insecurities, I guess. After that, they helped many students complete their tasks. They even helped many from Hufflepuff. Magnus was already being adorned by most of the students in the school, so whenever he talked to someone, they always showed respect, well, except for a few who were in Slytherin. Magnus knew he was very good at all kinds of charms and also transfiguration but when it came to podiwonering, he was average, but he had still not given up on the liquid luck. Meanwhile, Ragnar was below average at charms but god tier in podiwonering, he said he's liked podiwonering since he was small and had already memorized all recipes till 7th year as he had all the books at his home. Magnus had tried to ask him about his home, but Ragnar every time dodged the question. Dada was also an exciting class for Magnus and he excelled in it. It wasn't much different from charms. It was exciting to him as it taught various spells to find hidden secrets. The American teacher, Professor Harrison, was an excellent person. He had told everyone that he used to be an auror working for Makusa. He was in the department responsible for handling dark creatures attacking nomajas. He was a funny and easygoing man. But the first day was mostly theory and introduction. They would start learning practical things from the next class. But, there was something Magnus found strange, their potions and Dada class was with Gryffindor but he saw neither Sirius nor James. There was Lily but he didn't talk to her, considering how paranoid Snape was at the moment. Then there was the Herbology class with Ravenclaw, he liked these people as they were knowledgeable but some of them were too proud of it. Herbology was very easy for Magnus because he had a very good memory and had already memorized everything. Ragnar was also excellent in this subject. His reasoning was, to make amazing potions, I need high quality materials and I don't trust any herbologist so I grow my own herbs. Till now, Magnus had learned that Ragnar sucked at charms. Dada spells were also somewhat like charms so he expected him to suck at that too. But, what made him excited for the whole day was a flying lesson. He was already dreaming of how cool it would be. But to his luck, Mondays didn't have the flying lessons. So, he had to wait till the next day. Their day's schedule ended. Magnus had already done his homework. It was actually a lot. But it was just theoretical stuff and he was good at memorizing. He helped Ragnar complete it too and both of them were free during the study hall period. Where are we going, Magnus? Ragnar asked. To find the portrait of Merlin, Magnus replied with a smile. Magnus had found this information by hearing some students talking about his heritage. Magnus was still in a bit of shock but he had accepted this fact. Now, what he needed were answers. 
The portrait was on the walls by the grand staircase, next to the portrait of his Merlin's old friend and fellow courtier of King Arthur, Sir Cadogan. He quickly found the portrait. Inside, he saw Merlin standing, his beard was long and white and he wore a big robe with a hood. It was probably the fashion among the wizards of that era. Aha, so this was the boy you were talking about, Sir Cadogan exclaimed. Merlin's portrait smiled, haha, welcome to the Hogwitz, child. Now, I am just a portrait so I do not know about your past. Which family do you belong to and how did you find my inheritance? Magnus replied truthfully, hello, I am not from a magic family. My parents are non-magical people. I didn't find your inheritance, it would be correct to say it found me. Two years ago, I was lost and couldn't find a home. So I slept in a park under a tree. That tree talked to me in my sleep and since that day, I started having strange accidents. Just yesterday did I find out about my heritage. Merlin loudly laughed, Bwahaha, fabulous. You are from a non-magical family, that is even better. At least, I don't have to teach you about equality now. And about that tree, I believe you have talked to my will. Magnus nodded, yes, I did. But it said I am not ready for the knowledge or the gifts. Yes, yes, you must grow stronger. I have left you amazing things, Magnus. You will understand everything as you continue on this adventure. These damn new generations have destroyed the wizarding word that I worked so hard to improve. I see them daily talking about how their family is this or that or how they hate magbobs. Their minds have become so narrow-minded to understand that we all are from the same species. Merlin had a bit of sorrow in his voice. I understand, Arthur said the same thing about the muggle world, Magnus said. Wait, what? Did you already meet that bloke? Merlin exclaimed. Mwahahaha, I won, Merlin. Out of nowhere, Arthur appeared in Merlin's portrait. Magnus chuckled, yes, I found him in the Buckingham Palace. He was invisible to all but not me. Arthur started to crack his knuckled, you bastard, I'm gonna teach you a lesson. You've got no magic here. You left me invisible to rot there? Sir Cadogan, come here and help me. As your king, I command you? Yes, your majesty. Sir Cadogan also jumped to Merlin's portrait. Merlin grunted, huh, I can handle ten of you together, Arthur. I call you a bloke for a reason. Really? You green-eyed bastard, I will show you the power of my fist of fury. Arthur shouted and ran to attack Merlin. Merlin also got ready to fight. He passed the first punch to his face and countered with his staff. Bam. He punched the back of Arthur's head. But, Arthur came prepared, he lifted his leg as he was falling and bam. Straight to the baby makers of Merlin. Mwahaha, you don't need those anyway as they don't work. But they still hurt all the same. Have my nutcracker kick. You got them too. Bam. Merlin also hit his staff at Arthur's baby maker. Both of them fell to their knees. Sir Cadogan stood at the side and watched. Outside the portrait, Magnus and Ragnar watched it all. You want some, Ragnar? Magnus offered some popcorn to Ragnar. Both of them laughed while watching it. Haha, I can watch this all day, Magnus exclaimed. Suddenly, Arthur and Merlin turned to Magnus and felt embarrassed. Ah, Magnus, we were not fighting. We were just playing. See, we are brothers. Arthur helped Merlin get up. Yes, Magnus, you should be kind to people, Merlin added. Come on, fight. I still got the popcorn bag half full. Magnus nudged them. Merlin and Arthur smiled wryly. Magnus was also pulling their leg. Just kidding, I will be going now. Merlin, I have set up the portrait in my dorm. You can come and talk to me there. He said. Sure, lad. We will come. After that, Magnus left. And the fight resumed. Only one shall win today. Arthur shouted. Bam. Merlin. You cheater. Using rocks. Chapter 34. 34. A friend. After the talk with Merlin, they headed to Slytherin Dungeon. Do you know who our roommate is? Magnus inquired. Ragnar denied, no, when I woke up today, he was already gone. Then let's see who it is. He decided and strode to the dorms. But, as soon as they entered the dungeon, they were treated by loud claps. Straight for a minute they did not stop. As expected, the leader of this little event was Lucius. He was also clapping but slower and more gracefully than others. You are a true, Slytherin, Mr. Pendragon. You earned 60 points on the first day, Lucius said, bootlicking Magnus. What does this guy even want from me? Magnus wondered. 55 actually, 5 were earned by Ragnar. Magnus corrected him, stopping Lucius and making Ragnar hide behind him. He did not like being in the spotlight of these power-hungry snakes. Yes, Mr. Ouroboros has done great too. All students of Slytherin students should learn from you. We are, after all, born to be elites in the future. We cannot let our house lose the cup. Lucius spoke as if he was the leader of the house. If you keep this performance, you will someday get to meet a very great person I know. He knows about you and watches your performance. Lucius said suddenly. Magnus just nodded and left towards his dorm room. Who is this pervert keeping an eye on me? Sigh just as expected, things are not as simple as they seem. I need to learn about the political and social happenings of the wizarding world. They entered the room and finally saw who their roommate was. Ah, uh, knock before you enter, that's basic manners. Snape barked. Magnus chuckled, I don't need to knock to enter my room. Yeah, that's my bed. Snape's face reddened at the embarrassment. To save his face he pointed to Ragnar, I was talking to him. Ragnar was taken aback, he touched his chest and replied, Me? I'm staying in this room too. 
Magnus facepalmed himself and went straight to Snape's bed and sat down a good healthy distance away from him. Mate, what's your problem? Stop this pretentious bandwagon you're on. What do you get from acting all high and mighty? I am studying fifth year's books, I apparently belong to a magical family that's is nearly as old as this school. But I don't act arrogant. Do you know why? Because I was raised in a humble family. Born to parents you all call muggles. Magnus lectured him. He was already stuck with him for three years already, might as well just make him a friend. Seemed shocked for some reason. Wait, you're a muggle-born. Yes, I am. You got any problem with that? Magnus asked with his eyes probing him. No no, I thought you came from some very ancient pre-blood family. How are you Merlin's descendant? Snape inquired with genuine curiosity. I don't know, it's just in the blood. Besides, Merlin was also muggle-born, with an extra talent for magic. He explained. Then why are they treating like some big lord? Snape questioned. Because I am a hot commodity. They are pampering me before slaughtering me like a sacrifice. Don't you know the influence of just the word Merlin? If they have me by their side, they can use my name, Merlin's name, to their advantage. Also, I think many of them believe I'm a pure blood. Listen, Severus, we're in a snake's pit. Nobody can be trusted because you're for yourself. Everyone here wants to further their careers or wealth by stepping on others. Remember, this is Slytherin. Magnus concluded. That means I can't trust you either, Snape argued. Magnus smiled, haha, did you forget what happened at the sorting ceremony so easily? The hat said I fit in all four houses. Brave, cunning, loyal, and sharp-minded. I got it all. And no one thing, Severus. The thing I despise the most for some reason is betrayal. And I would never betray my friends or family. The rest is up to you to decide. Come on, Ragnar. You're too thin, I smuggled some sweets for you. What the hell, I'm not that thin, Ragnar retorted. Slowly, the noise faded from Snape's ears as he fell into deep contemplating. What he found out today was that Magnus was way more intelligent in the aspects of cunningness than he showed everyone. Most saw him as a naive child but he didn't believe that now. He remembered his whole life till now. An abusive father, an abused mother. He always wondered, why did his mother even marry his good-for-nothing father? She came from a pure-blood respected family after all. He always wondered, why did she never retaliate even while having the power to do so? Then his eyes fell on Magnus. A boy, who had everything, good parents, probably money too, now also the influence of his heritage. Yet he stayed humble. He was either too dumb or just being his real self. Till now, his only friends were his books and Lily Evans, now, only books were left, and sadly, they don't reply to his words. His thoughts were interrupted when he heard Magnus whining at Ragnar. Ragnar, tell me your secret. I remember every recipe for every potion. Yet I'm average. Why? Magnus asked. Ragnar scratched his head, not knowing what to say, I don't know. I also follow the recipe with little changes here and there. I think what you lack is physical knowledge, how all ingredients work, mix, and react. You hand movements. Magnus and Ragnar turned their heads. It was Snape who spoke. What do you mean? I turned my hands in the cauldron just the way it said in the book. Magnus argued. The speed of your hands movement also matters, also it varies from potion to potion, from ingredients to ingredients and which side you are mixing it. I believe Ragnar should know this. Snape questioned. Ragnar thought, hmm, know that you say. I do adjust my hand speed. But it happens instinctively to me. I don't even think about it. Snape felt personally attacked, then you might become the best potion master in history. Magnus chuckled, haha, but he sucks at charms. But, Ragnar, do not forget this friendship when you become a top potion master. Make them for free for me please, from time to time. Just a little liquid luck would do. Ragnar chuckled, sure, I will give you a discount, of a negative 100, percenter. Magnus' face fell. He looked at Snape, if you know this then this means you're gonna be a potion master too. I guess I'll leech on you then. And I think I will quit on this subject entirely, don't have enough time to focus on such fine details. I'm satisfied with being average at this. Gotta leave some places for the rest after all. We can teach you, Ragnar suggested and looked at Snape. Sure, only if he teaches us transfiguration, Snape said. Deal, Magnus agreed instantly, shocking Snape. Why would he give his secrets so easily, Snape thought. Dumbledore's office. Eugenia Jenkins, the minister for magic had come to meet the old man. She had received a reply to the letter and it was one word. Yes. But she needed to know more. So she came here personally. Is he really Merlin's descendant? She straightforwardly asked. Yes, he is. I believe by now you've heard about the current predicament the Muggle Queen is in. Dumbledore inquired. Minister Jenkins' eyes widened, he's related to it. Dumbledore nodded, it's not just Merlin he's related to. King Arthur too. He put some emphasis on his next words, he is the rightful king. Minister Jenkins was shaken as she took a few steps to the side and sat down on the chair. How many know about this? She inquired. Very few, Dumbledore answered. She took a long breath, the amount of influence he's going to have on the magical world will be unimaginable. Merlin and now Arthur. They will come after him like hyenas. That is why we must protect him, Dumbledore advised and came closer to her with a serious face. I met him in private, and I told him his situation. Minister, he's a sweet child, but, he made it clear, that if something were to happen to his family, he will not forget. Dumbledore said, 
Then I will place Aurors to protect them, she decided. No, you must not do that. Dumbledore quickly stopped her and continued. I will send my people to safeguard them. The ministry has been compromised, he sternly said. Minister Jenkins got up in anger, do you know your order is an illegal organization? Yes, but it's necessary. With the ministry compromised, we have no choice. We must fight back. Dumbledore raised his voice a little. She looked not convinced, do you know how much pressure is on me these days? With every new dead muggle, they are talking more and more about replacing me. And a change of administration is the last thing we need right now, it is what they want. If they find out about your little stunt, the Wisengamot will be after my blood. The Wisengamot is run by them, Dumbledore argued loudly, shocking her a little. This old man still had the strength it seemed. Dumbledore continued, the order was created to fight him, minister, nothing else. And the ministry is already adamant on not catching the murderers. He and his army of so-called Death Eaters will continue to murder. Someone has to stop them. Minister Jenkins didn't speak for a full minute. Then she took a long breath. Sigh. Fine, fine. I am still skeptical of you, Dumbledore. But I will look the other way this one time. But, the boy and his family must be kept safe, no matter what. We finally have a ray of hope for this black and white world. We can't lose him now. Good night, headmaster. She left after saying that. Tired, yet a bit eased up, Dumbledore sat back onto his chair. Why did you take this path, Tom? Why? But he didn't have the luxury to relax. He got up and operated away, to an unknown house in the middle of nowhere, where he had called out a meeting. Chapter 35, 35. The Letter. Dumbledore arrived at the rundown house, which was basically non-existent to outsiders as it was under Fidelius' charm and Dumbledore was the sole secret keeper. But there was only his brother there at that moment. He had a tense and tired face. I had a talk with the minister. She has agreed to look the other way, but I do not have much hope that she will be able to hold on to her position. So, we must act fast. Dumbledore started. Aberforth Dumbledore, younger brother of Albus Dumbledore, stood up, anger was raging on his face. Albus, this is Grindelwald all over again. And why is it that it has something to do with you again? I'm tired of this now, I don't feel like I can even trust you. Don't think I am a fool, I know what his real identity is. I saw the boy many times at Hogsmeade. Albus was hurt a little, hearing this from his own brother. He felt like he aged a few more years, he was a little boy, Aberforth. Did you expect me to kill him? Like any ordinary student, I gave him a chance to study at Hogwarts. But you saw him grow. You must have noticed the changes in his personality. Yet you did nothing. Because Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore can never be wrong, right? You knew but were afraid to accept it, and now look at this mess. Innocent people are dying out there. Innocent. He suddenly shut up as he saw the noise of people coming in. Aberforth, do not make this knowledge public or you will do more harm than good. Albus quickly said. I don't even care now. Do whatever you want. He muttered angrily. The door opened and walked in one of the most important members of the order. Alastair Mad-Eye Moody. Moody's wore a magical eye, which was electric blue and earned him his nickname Mad-Eye. This eye allowed him to see through anything, such as wood, invisibility cloaks and the back of his head. He was a fine auror but even he was displeased with the capabilities of the ministry so he joined. Behind him were many more members, some were very old people that Dumbledore knew from back in the days. Professor McGonagall was also there but she rarely participated in order-related activities. Today, she needed to be here because the matter of Magnus was to be asked. Good that you all came here. The ministry will not be a problem for a while. We will need to coordinate and be decisive in each of our attacks. Remember, for Voldemort, his Death Eaters are cannon fodder, but we cannot risk our lives like that. We are already limited in numbers. Dumbledore spoke. What about that Merlin boy? Moody asked suddenly. Everyone turned to him with a weird face. Dumbledore too, what are you talking about, Alastair? Magnus is just 11 years old. No matter how good he is, we cannot involve him. This is not his war to fight, and he is meant to be the future of the British magical world. Moody grunted, Gur, give me the boy for a month and I will hoop some spells into him. By the end, he'll turn out to be a better fighter than most of the sissy aurors. McGonagall was enraged by this idea, I will not have my students be used as tools. He is a student of Hogwarts, and it is the duty of Professor Dumbledore and the Ministry to ensure their safety. If something happens to him, it will be on you. Moody was not satisfied and he muttered lowly, Ha, so now her motherly instincts awaken, old hag. Enough, we have more pressing matters than to discuss whether we should drag an eleven-year-old into war, Dumbledore shouted and resumed the meeting. Planning on doing a hit on a few unguarded Death Eaters. London. Bobby had been missing his best friend dearly. Both had been like brothers since young. They went to school together and played together. But even he knew he depended a lot on Magnus and now he was all alone. He had skipped the ninth grade now, going straight to tenth grade, to the second year of high school. It was a totally different school as the one where he studied didn't teach the high schoolers. This was making him even more nervous. He had heard about bullies in these schools, they especially targeted short kids. And he was very short because he had already skipped 6th and 7th grade, now he had skipped 8th grade too. So, while he should have been in 7th grade, he was in 10th, at the young age of 11. While the average high schooler was 14 years old at a minimum. Sigh with a strong face, he got ready. You can do this, Bobby. He cheered for himself. Ding dong. 
He quickly ran downstairs to see who it was his mother was busy in the kitchen. Oh, Kyler. Mail today. Bobby knew this guy, an honest mailman. His five-year-old daughter had gotten into a big road accident and he had no insurance. So, with the help of knowledge taught by Magnus, he enrolled in a bunch of spelling and mathematical competitions, he won them and gave the money to the mailman, so he could pay for his daughter's treatment. This was something taught to him by Magnus. He had said, Bobby, you will keep on getting smarter now, as I have made sure your foundation is strong. But, in most people, with knowledge comes arrogance. So, I want you to never stop being humble, help whomever you can while staying within your limits. Actually, I read this in a book and it sounded cool so I memorized it. Kyler smiled as he had gotten very motivated by this boy here. To him, Bobby was like an angel. For a man who earns as little as him, the help Bobby gave was a godsend. Yes, by the way, my daughter just saw your face in the interview today. You just skipped your ninth grade? You must be very smart. Kyler said. Bobby scratched his head awkwardly. Well, I also skipped sixth and seventh grade. It's not a big deal. Don't know why they are making it so big now. My daughter said she wants to be as smart as you someday. He excitedly added. Bobby nodded, well, my advice, math is very important. Don't let her slack on it. He then took the letter and went inside his house. He read where it was from, and just from looking at the texture of the paper, he had an idea where it was from. He smilingly went to his room and opened it. Drop. A small chocolate bar dropped from it. Bobby, taste it. This is so amazing. The best chocolate I've ever eaten in my life. They said it is made of some magical animal's milk. Haha, <laughs> he read the first words and smiled. He picked up the candy bar and ate it. Hmm, it does taste amazing. Every single bite feels different. He muttered to himself and continued. Letter. Bobby, my brother, I have found myself in a worse gutter than I initially had thought it was. I found out about my powers and why I could see that portrait. But I cannot afford to tell you that in a letter as it might put your life in danger. Just know this, I am stuck with a bunch of racists, who want to use me for their personal gains. There are powerful people after me too. But for now, I am safe inside the walls of the school. Also, I found new friends. His name is Ragnar. He was being bullied so I took him in. There is also a boy, named Severus, he has hots for a girl but he's insecure. He thought I liked his girl so he was angry at me. Most kids here are broken in one way or another. I also found out that I suck in the poti wondering subject. So you can have some solace in the fact that I am not perfect, he <laughs> he. Leave this, your school must be about to start. I know where you are going, it is a school for higher intellectual children. You will meet many smart brains there. Keep improving yourself, because what I have found out about my heritage is going to explode your brains. But in the future, I will need your help a lot as I know I can trust you, so, I hope when we reach that point, we are both awesome. By the way, don't tell this to my mummy, or she might come here and kill my old beardy headmaster. Sincere, ha, just kidding, I'm never writing formal letters. Sincerely, the one who hooped your ass in elementary school. Also, this letter will explode in five seconds. Letter ends. As soon as he read that last line, he immediately threw it away. But, six seconds passed and nothing happened. Ha ha ha. A low laugh came soon in with that, the paper turned into ashes. Bobby chuckled, his mood got way lot better. But then he frowned, that bastard. Now I gotta clean the room again. Chapter 36, 36. Newspaper. Magnus was taught some potions by Snape and Ragnar last night. The next morning, he woke up happy. He looked at Chad, who was soundly sleeping on the leg side of his bed. He wanted to get comfy on his body but he was so fat that Magnus felt like suffocating. He got up and got dressed quickly. He glanced at the portrait of Arthur. In it, he saw him and Merlin playing chess together. Where did you find it? He asked. Heh, Arthur took it from some painting. We'll return it later. Good luck with your flying lessons. Us two were born flyers, so you better not shame us. Merlin spoke without looking at him. Magnus shrugged at them and went out of his room. His two roommates had already left. He went straight to the Grand Hall for breakfast. That was also when the newspapers arrived and he had subscribed to one. Well, there weren't many newspapers in the British magical world that covered all the news. Choices were very limited. A random owl came and threw the package down onto his empty plate. Magnus quickly took out a piece of meat from the other plate and threw it masterfully in front of the owl. Here you go, boy, Magnus said smilingly. The owl happily ate it and flew away, making sure to remember this human's face as he was a good human. Everyone just stupidly looked at him do it, while Magnus heeded no mind to them and unfolded the newspaper. Okay, let's see what's happening around us. First page is supposed to be very important. Hmm. Fire in a chocolate factory, the owner, Charlie, got arrested by Aurors. Charged with enslaving dwarf squibs and torturing them to sing songs. What kind of news is this? Okay, let's try the next one. Ah, something serious. Wait, this isn't serious. A broomstick accident, two people collided in midair. One survived by operating and the other died. Magnus was shocked. Ragnar was also shocked. How did they collide in the vast sky? That's not the point. What kind of newspaper is this? This isn't news. These are gossips. Magnus muttered. Look, your photo, Snape exclaimed as he was facing the back end of the newspaper, which could also be considered the front page. God, when did they take my picture? 
Hmm, return of Merlin, after nearly a thousand years, the bloodline of the Great Prince of Enchanters has returned to the magical community. Not only that, but he has also inherited the Muggle King, Arthur Pendragon, who helped Merlin in defeating Morgan Elife. We wish Mr. Pendragon great success in his life going forward. The article said. Magnus sighed and turned the pages. He read every news item. But then he found the most important news in parts most ignored by readers. In small columns in the lower middle center of the inner pages, muggles and half-blood wizards attacked and killed. Suspicion is directed towards Death Eaters. Is this the return of some Dark Lord? Ministry of Magic under strain, the death of wizards are unacceptable. Last night's deaths. Dark Mark cast in the night sky. All these headlines were hidden so dutifully that if one was not reading the paper attentively, they would have missed it. Hmm, so there is someone who wants to kill all muggles and half-blood wizards? I guess I need to get serious in my training. Otherwise, by the time I complete school, it'll be too late he decided. What is it? Ragnar asked. No, nothing. Let's eat and go to our first class. Charms are going to be fun, don't worry, Ragnar. I will help. Eh, hey, I'm feeling dizzy, Ragnar complained. It was the charms class first thing in the morning. They were supposed to sit together with the first years of Ravenclaw. In the charms class, they as expected were to practice levitation spell. I heard about your marvelous explanation behind the creation of levitation spell in yesterday's history class. Flitwick gave Magnus a compliment the first thing in the morning. So, the first charm of the class was the levitation charm. Magnus was able to fly the feather around so fast that it created a mini tornado, which was also making all the other feathers in the room fly. Flitwick clapped crazily, aha, just what I would expect from an up-and-coming prince of enchanters. Magnus did it very easily and got five points for Slytherin. Professor Flitwick was very excited to see him and excel. He was non-stop pouring praises on him. Ravenclaw students could only look at him in envy. Of course, this was expected off of you. Merlin was after all the best in charms Flitwick said the same thing for the third time. Till now, all professors he had met were saying the same thing. Compare him to the old Merlin on every corner. It made him a little nervous. Everyone had such high expectations off of him. I guess to come out of this, I need to surpass that old man too. Hmm. He fell into deep contemplation. After his own task was done, he helped Ragnar at least make the feather fly a little to pass the class. Snape didn't need any help as even in subjects he was bad at, he was above average. Next came the class Magnus had been anticipating. The class of flying along with Hufflepuff students. It was taught by Madame Rolanda Hooch, the Hogwarts flying instructor and Quidditch referee. They came out to the open fields which were the training grounds for the Quidditch teams. There, they gathered in two lines with their brooms in their hands. These were pretty standard brooms. Then like a hawk, Madame Hooch came with a whistle and spoke quickly, Well, what are you doing? Those broomsticks aren't gonna fly themselves out of boredom. Now, stick out your right hand over your broom, and say up. She instructed everyone. Magnus, with a big smile on his face, put his hand forward and put it over the broom. He passionately wanted to fly on it, it was a dream of most humans, to fly in the air. Flying in aeroplanes doesn't count because you cannot feel the wind on your face. Whoosh. Without even speaking, the broomstick came to his hand, as if a child returning to its father. Stunningly done, Mr. Pendragon. Ah, you have done it too, Ms. Vanity. Good job, five points to Slytherin for being so good at this. She praised them. Magnus looked to see who it was, it was a girl with long black hair, but her eyes were the most striking features. As they appeared so differently. Her irises were sparkling light blue in color while the pupil being dark black. She smugly looked at him and showed her tongue to tease him. Magnus chuckled and ignored her. He was not doing this for a competition, he really wanted to fly. Madame Hooch showed everyone how to mount the broomstick and how to hold it so as to not fall from it. Magnus felt so at ease once he was on it. Okay, now we will practice basic liftoff and landing. Kick off the ground hard and try to rise a little. Then try to maintain that height. Then slowly proceed to come down to the ground. Ready. She instructed them. All students were able to do it. Ragnar had prior experience and Snape was average. But Magnus, well, he was not a normal kid. He as told, pushed the ground hard, a little too hard actually. He ended up being thrown at least 50 feet in the air. Magnus' heartbeat got faster as he felt a tingling sensation in his stomach. It was amazing, he loved the view from this thing. For as far as he could see, beyond the Hogwarts, there was just jungle. Yes. This is life. This is why I came here. He shouted so loud that people could hear him on the ground too. Freedom. Magnus shouted and suddenly moved forward on the broomstick by pressing it forward. It was very easy for him to get a hang of it and he felt he was a natural too. He maneuvered like a champ, making rolls, making drift turns and feints. Sudden sharp turns. He could do it all. Madame Hooch smiled from the ground. Not fair, I wanna go up there too. The same girl from before, Vanity, complained. His case is different, Ms. Vanity. Madame Hooch argued. What? He's the second coming of Merlin? That's not fair, I wanna fly too. If he's the second coming of Merlin, then I am the second coming of whoever invented the broomsticks. She defiantly said and kicked off the ground. She also expertly flew up to the sky to intercept Magnus. I'll teach you who's the boss. She muttered to herself with a smirk. Chapter 37, 37. Detention. Whoosh. Magnus was enjoying the fresh air blasting on his face. 
He had probably broken a few rules by now but he wanted to do this, enjoy this, ever since he had heard about broomsticks. Huh, I will earn the points back he thought. He was zooming around various buildings, making many dangerous maneuvers. The broomstick was not the fastest as it was just for first years for training, but it was enough for now. Not so fast, Merlin boy. Suddenly a voice came from behind Magnus. He looked back and saw the girl with pretty eyes. You can fly too? You seem good. I can say the same about you. Emma Vanity, by the way. She introduced herself. Magnus Grand Emery's Pendragon. He breathed out his new full name. This was the name by which he was officially registered at Hogwarts. I know that. Probably the whole school. No, the whole British magical community knows that. She replied, but then a sudden smirk appeared on her face. Wanna race? Whoever circles the Hogwarts main building and reaches the training fields wins and has to buy the winner the most expensive chocolate available. She suggested. How much does the most expensive chocolate cost? Magnus inquired out of curiosity. Not much, just a few hundred galleons. She replied nonchalantly. Magnus' head immediately did the calculations. I only have a thousand left. Can't lose those for some chocolates that I'm not even going to enjoy. Okay, let's do this. But if I win, I don't want chocolates, I want a book costing the same amount as the chocolate. He said. Deal. Okay, I will throw this ribbon to the ground. The second it touches the ground, we start. She set the rules and got ready. Magnus had his eyes on the ribbon as if he was an eagle. He saw it slowly falling to the ground. In his mind, he calculated the time it would take for it to touch down because it was hard to recognize if it had touched down from this height. Then he waited patiently. Whoosh. To his shock, Emma started before him, but she was actually on time. He also raced and was not too far behind her. Haha, I'm going to win this, Merlin boy, she shouted. Magnus chuckled, we'll see. He slowly started to catch up to her and was crossing her. She saw it and was amazed because their brooms were the same and Magnus was heavier than her, yet he was faster. She couldn't understand how. Unknown to her, it was not her fault. It was the fault of the whole magical society's education system. Magnus was using a simple thing in physics called aerodynamics. He had purposefully ducked down his body and his chin was basically touching the broom, different from Emma, who was riding it like a normal bicycle. I won't let you win. She suddenly tried to block his path and made fake kicks. She was not going to really kick him and endanger his life, she knew it was dumb. It had some effect and Magnus and he was again left behind. Ah, I can't lose my money like this. I guess I'll have to do it. My ultra secret technique. He again streamlined himself to reduce air resistance and caught up to her. Then, he shouted loudly, oh my god. With that, he made the most exaggerated shocked face possible and looked to his left side, towards the buildings. It was human nature to be curious, so Emma also looked to her left. And soon, she felt a pinch on her right cheek. Flick. Ouch. She cried. Magnus had flicked on her right cheek with his finger. See you at the finish line. She immediately realized she was fooled. But all her attempts to get the lead were futile as Magnus continuously flew away from her. This is cheating. She complained loudly. She immediately received a reply with fading laughter. My mummy told me to treat girls equally. Ha 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 ha. She pouted and continued on to return to the finish line. Soon, the crowd came into her view and with a frowning face, she landed on the ground. Magnus and Emma were both surrounded by their excited classmates. But then, an angry Madame Hooch came, that was extremely reckless, Mr. Pendragon and Ms. Vanity. You two are to spend two hours in detention. Magnus didn't protest, he was just happy for having saved his money from this witch. He turned to her smugly, ha, I will tell you the name of the book tomorrow, ha. Huh. She scoffed and walked the other way. Miss Vanity, the detention is that way. Madame Hooch interrupted her, embarrassing her even more. Magnus, holding his laughter, walked towards the detention room. While leaving, he waved towards Ragnar and Severus. The detention room of Hogwarts was nothing but a room with some students' desks. There were also many bookshelves. But to Magnus' horror, all of them were about how to be good students, Hogwarts laws, and other things related to that. There was no teacher but instead ghosts. Keeping an eye on them. But, to his surprise, he and Emma were not alone. There was a curly-haired boy too. Sirius. Magnus voiced. Sirius and James were sitting on the front side of the room. Sirius looked back and laughed haha, we knew you would come here sooner than later. James also added, finally, the god has come down among us mortals. Yeah yeah, what are you in for? Magnus asked as if they were prisoners. We made our classmates have opposite genders voice with the help of a powder. Professor McGonagall caught us. This was yesterday, today Slughorn sent us here because we put pepper powder in many cauldrons. Everyone ran out of the lab coughing. Sirius explained as if they were triumphs. What kind of animals are you? Emma blurted. And who do we have here? Miss Righteous Princess? Since when did a Slytherin start worrying about people? James retorted. He's also a Slytherin, she pointed to Magnus. No, he belongs to all houses, we heard the hat. Besides, I've known him from before Hogwarts. But I don't know you. What's your name? Sirius asked her, this time seriously. I am Emma Vanity, she replied. Sirius' shoulders relaxed, ah, so you are one of the better pure blood families. What did you two do? Kiss in public. Magnus nearly choked on his saliva, what the, no. We were racing on our brooms, who won? James asked almost immediately. He was a fanatic when it came to flying. 
Magnus proudly raised his head. Who other than me? Huh, he cheated. Emma protested. Sure, the loser always has some excuse. Magnus spoke back. Hearing this, Emma huffed and went to a corner to sit alone. What's her deal? Sirius asked. Ignore her. She just lost a bet. So, what do we do here now? I don't want to read those books. Magnus asked. Both Sirius and James looked at each other. They nodded and made Magnus sit with them. We were planning a prank. A big one this time. It might take some time to complete. No hard feelings, but we want to turn the pants of all Slytherin boys into skirts. Also, put lipstick on their faces. Magnus nodded and thought for a second. Hmm, it can be done. But it will need a lot of planning. Let's do it. Are you serious? Will you prank your own house? They excitedly asked. Sure, why not? They have been a pain in the back since day one. Always acting so strictly, there is no fun. Magnus complained. Sirius was happy, cool, let's do it then. And so, they started planning. After a while, their detention was over and they could go out. Emma angrily left alone. Magnus also decided to leave. Let's do this. He raised his hand to high-five them. They also high-fived him, and Sirius and James high-fived each other too. But, to their horrors, they suddenly found out that their hands had gotten stuck together. Eh, what happened? Sirius questioned himself. It's as if, someone glued our hands, James observed. But when they turned to look at Magnus, he was already walking away and was at the door. Realization quickly hit them. Magnus looked at them one last time with a mischievous smile, have fun sleeping on the same bed, lads. He left after that. Sirius and James looked at each other in horror. Apparently, the pranksters got pranked. That bastard. Sirius cursed. This was a good one, admit it, Sirius. But we will have our revenge soon. James said, already planning ahead. That's fine, but what about this? We can't go out there. They will think we're, involved. Sirius nervously said. And for the next few months, rumors spread around the school that Sirius and James were hot on each other. It was suspected that the rumor came from them holding hands and a certain loud mouth from Slytherin. Chapter 38, 38. True Blood Status. A week passed, Magnus was enjoying his life in Hogwarts. He would usually spend most of his time either studying, practicing magic, trying to make the liquid luck, pranking his friends or flying. But, now his life had a headache, that girl Emma, was always trying to get her revenge by trying to prank him, although none of them succeeded. He had asked her to get him an advanced potions book. She did it grudgingly but her grudge didn't stop. I'm telling you, Mag, she got a crush on you, I mean, if I was a girl, I'd be after you too, you are every girl's dream, a strong, intelligent guy, their prince charming, heck, you are going to be the king. Ragnar had gotten really comfortable with his words around Magnus, but around others, he was still like a puppy, though Magnus was changing that too, by slowly making him grow a spine. Snape, who was walking on the other side of Magnus, shrank his nose in disgust, what a vile thought to have. Ragnar scoffed, don't lie to me, Severus, if you were a girl, you'd be drooling over him too. Magnus laughed, well, he already got someone to drool over so stop this hankip hanky talk of yours. Did you practice the charms I gave you? You should at least know the lifesaver ones. Yeah yeah, I did. But they are too hard for me, I mean, I can't seem to be able to move my wand correctly. Ragnar argued. Snape shook his head in disappointment, such a waste of talent, your poti wandering is probably the best in history and you can't even cast charms. Ragnar looked at him with fake anger, yeah, you're the one to say. Stop ogling that Gryffindor girl now and focus on your studies. Okay, stop fighting now, I will be going with the old man Dumbledore to Gringotts tomorrow. I gotta take the inheritance test. Magnus revealed. Hmm, Mr. Malfoy was talking about discussing something with you yesterday. He did not ask me but I did hear him. Snape suddenly spoke. Sev, stop idolizing that man. He is a manipulator and he's been trying since I stepped on this school grounds. If you're just after his family name and resources then I've got more than that. Though I don't know about the money side of the situation, I will know that tomorrow. Magnus advised him. They walked into the Slytherin dungeon. But as soon as Magnus entered, he felt the presence of magic and immediately ducked. Ah oh, hey, hey. No. It was Emma, trying to plaster a cake on his face. Bam. It hit Ragnar's face. He turned angry at her. You, I will not help you at potions now. Huh. Magnus smirked. That is once again, 12 losses and 0 wins for you. Just give up, girl. You are too small for this. He turned to the side and went to talk to Narcissa Black. She was although a manipulative woman, she sometimes seemed very nice as if that was her original personality, but the cold one had taken over. He couldn't imagine how a man like Lucius was able to win her heart, he had nothing except good looks and a family name, maybe some brain too but it was as good as nothing. Good evening, Miss Black. He greeted her. I told you to call me sister or just Narcissa. No need to be so formal now, Magnus. She replied with a smile, which seemed half genuine and half politically driven. She sat by the fireplace, reading some random book about blood purity. He was still not sure if she knew he came from a muggle family though, still having trouble with potions. She asked. Yup, I'm just average at it. I want to be better, he said, with a bit of frustration in his sound. She chuckled, hee hee, it's okay being average in a few things when you are outstanding in all others. Have you thought about what you will do after school? Be the king maybe, he muttered. 
By now, everyone knew the reason he had Pendragon in his name. Maybe I can help. Lucius appeared and took a seat. Magnus took his senses to the highest limit. This man was not to be trusted at all. And what might that be? He questioned. You are an elite, Mr. Pendragon. You are the descendant of one of the oldest magical families and the ruler of a nation. You deserve to be someone great. I myself think that if I do work for someone, he must be the greatest. Lucius started weaving his web. He was trying his best to manipulate Magnus. He believed Magnus was pure blood because of his magical talent. The part about him being the inheritor of King Arthur II was guessed to be a blessing of Merlin. Do you know about your ancestor Merlin studying under Salazar Slytherin? Lucius asked. Yes, I know that. He must have learned a great deal from Salazar Slytherin, to be able to rise to become such a famous wizard. Magnus replied by overemphasizing on Salazar, wanting to see where Lucius was getting to. Lucius smiled, yes, that is indeed the case. If it weren't for Salazar Slytherin, Merlin would have never been able to rise to heights. Salazar Slytherin was a great wizard with unimaginable power. But, sadly, his future generations all died. There are no descendants remaining, all except one, the true heir to Salazar Slytherin. Magnus acted shocked, who is he? A great man, who believes in us, the purest of blood. Under his command, the wizard kind will see a new era, where we rule all. Lucius dreamily explained. He then finally announced the name, his name is, Lord Voldemort. Magnus quickly put two and two together. So that dark wizard is after me? His followers are killing people. Does Lord Voldemort wish for the service of an eleven-year-old child? Magnus asked. Haha, no no. He is very wise and caring, he does not want you to do anything. He only wants you to study and get stronger, but, to show allegiance you will have to get a tattoo on your arm. Lucius said. Magnus nodded. Lucius was already gloating inside his heart, thinking it was mission successful. What do you know about my family history? Magnus asked suddenly. Lucius was confused, of course, they must be respected pure blood wizards, to be related to Merlin, you must have a long long history. Lucius was speaking nonsense now, he was not able to find out about any magical family related to Magnus, so he guessed that it must be some secret family. Magnus shook his head, ha, no you are wrong, my family are actually muggles, I am the first wizard in the family, and, to the offer of Lord Voldemort, I refuse, he announced. Nearly everyone present there stopped talking, many had their eyes widened at the revelation, especially Narcissa and Malfoy. The atmosphere tensed a lot, feeling as if an explosion would happen at any moment. Lucius gritted his teeth so loud everyone could hear them. He was not a person to get angry so easily but right now, he felt betrayed, deceived, he even treated Magnus so well after what happened on the train. He lowered himself just to have a good image in front of him, but now, it was not necessary. Narcissa, on the other hand, looked at Magnus in, pity? Lucius got up from his chair, his worst guesses had turned true, you filthy mudblood. Deceiving us. Using us. Stand up. Sit on the floor. That is your rightful place. That is your worth, right on the filth. Magnus did get up, with a common plain face, but his blue eyes now looked dark red. His chin held high in pride and confidence. He had already decided before coming to Hogwarts that he was not going to let someone bully him. So you got deceived by a filthy mudblood? What does that make you, a person with intelligence even lesser than a filthy mudblood? Ah, you are ultra filthy pure blood then. Magnus talked back in a chilling voice. Shut up, mudblood. Whoosh. Lucius had taken out his wand and its pointy tip was touching Magnus' head do it. Magnus voiced with a smile. Just then, Lucius felt something, he looked down, there was Magnus' wand and its tip was touching his crotch. His eyes flickered in a slight panic. He turned back to Magnus, you wouldn't dare, mudblood. Sigh. Do you know we all have the same DNA? We are all humans of the same species, called homo sapiens. Ah, what am I even asking? Your primitive chimpanzee brain cannot comprehend such complex concepts. I recommend you do it. Blow my head out, but I promise you, you will not be able to make little Malfoys with sweet sister Narcissa then. Malfoy family patriarch wouldn't want that, right? Magnus mocked him, loud and clear, in front of all. In his short time here, Magnus had learned one thing about Slytherin, that it was the law of jungle. The strongest rules all, now it was Lucius. But Magnus needed some followers too. Even one or two would be enough. I will kill you. Lucius was still enraged. Magnus smiled, do it. But no one thing, you will be killing the last descendant of Merlin. The whole magical world will be after your blood then. Not just yours, but your whole family. We've even got enough witnesses. It was a stalemate now. Magnus was getting tired of it. Lucius most likely didn't have the guts to do anything. He could only scare people. Bam. Thanks dad. Magnus kicked. A perfect army style kick to the knees of Lucius from the side, making him fall to his knees. Next, like a dragon putting his claws on his neck, Lucius saw Magnus grabbing his throat. His grip was inhumanly strong and his eyes looked chilly. Cough. Before coming to this school, I was not playing in the sandbox in the park. I was learning, reading, and by reading, I knew there would be bigots like you. Lucius Malfoy, what should I do to you now, should I end it? He was, of course, bluffing, he couldn't kill someone like that. Also, he had never killed anyone and didn't want to do it at such a young age. What he wanted was for Lucius to surrender. Lucius was shivering, as he couldn't breathe properly. Surrender, Lucius Malfoy, Magnus advised. 
It was a huge humiliation for Lucius. He couldn't let this end here or he'd turn into a laughing stock for entire magical Britain. He was a seventh year, an adult wizard, after all, losing to a first year was out of options. And never. Mute blood. C-O-N-F Ringo. Lucius instantly aimed his wand at Magnus and a bright yellow light came out of its tip, straight towards Magnus's head. Boom. Chapter 39, 39. A mess. Many held their breath as the bright yellow light came out of the tip of Lucius's wand, headed straight to Magnus' head. It all happened so fast, yet time seemed to have gotten slow. Snape and Ragnar had gone to the dorm room so they weren't there to react. But they were halfway to the common room when they heard the commotion going on. But when they arrived, they were already too late. C-O-N-F Ringo. Nu. Narcissa was seen shouting as she knew the consequences of this. All looked in horror. Already knowing what would happen to Magnus' head now, it would be turned into a pulp. And they immediately felt dread, because all this was happening inside the common room of their house. Magnus was not dumb, he was already expecting the zealot to act like one. He was too into the whole pure blood theory that he truly believed he was superior to other people. Magnus had his wand in his other hand, just waiting to counter. But what had shocked Magnus a little was that he had not expected Lucius would hit to actually kill him. He was only expecting some small retaliation. Does he not love his life? Magnus used his wand to counter the attack with all his might. He cast a counter to the blasting curse. The counter was nothing but to use another blasting curse to neutralize the incoming attack. C-O-N-F Ringo. He muttered immediately and countered the attack. The two spells touched each other and there was a small high intensity tug of war between them, but it was eventually fading away. Crack. Oops. Magnus exclaimed as he noticed a crack on his wand. He prayed that it would hold on till the end of this incident. Boom. The two spells stopped each other with a bang. But, the loud boom was actually from Magnus' wand. It was in pieces now and he had fallen back due to the blast. Lucius stayed kneeling on the ground, now silent and a bit shocked that his magic was stopped by Magnus. He again tried to lift his wand but realized something. He wasn't able to lift his arm, he couldn't even feel it. He started hyperventilating a bit. Magnus looked at Lucius, huh, so I broke your arm? Sorry about that, but I didn't expect that you would try to kill me. Then he looked around and said, now, if someone were to ask, can I expect that everyone will be truthful here? Everyone there understood what he meant and they nodded their heads nervously. Magnus, are you okay? Ragnar ran up to him. Yeah, I'm fine, but can't say the same about my wand, huh, it was incompatible with me anyway, he muttered. Lucius's eyes widened when he heard that, he could have killed me if he had a good wand. Severus, can you call Professor Slughorn? He's the head of Slytherin after all. Magnus requested. Nodding to him, Snape left the hall. You mud blow. Stop it, Lucius. We need to get you to the infirmary, what if the damage becomes permanent? Narcissa suddenly voiced, indirectly trying to save his skin now. Lucius stopped blurting and nodded to his girlfriend. She helped him get up with a few loyal followers of Lucius. She looked at Magnus while going away and felt conflicted. She knew what happened today had totally destroyed the face Lucius had in front of him. Now she feared that if the Dark Lord didn't win, the Malfoy family was done for. What happened? Ragnar asked him. He found my heritage and called me Mudblood. Magical society really needs a makeover, people are openly supporting Dark Lords and murderers. He replied. Wait, which Dark Lord? Ragnar inquired. Voldemort or something, Magnus said, but, for some reason, Ragnar's face stiffened hearing that, though he did not say anything. What happened here? Slughorn quickly came to the common room. He saw the destroyed furniture and Magnus' wand. Everyone was looking at Magnus so he immediately asked, What happened here, Mr. Pendragon? Racism, that's what's happened. Lucius Malfoy tried to recruit me into the army of a dark lord named Voldemort. I refused and told him I belonged to a muggle family. He called me Mudblood and blasted a C-O-N-F Ringo straight towards my face. Thankfully, I was able to save myself, but my wand got destroyed in the process. You might want to take the testimony of all around us and also check the record on Lucius' wand. He immediately clarified. Hearing this, Slughorn was quite horrified. Racism, illegal activity, and mortally endangering someone. These were taboo in Hogwarts. He also felt very bad hearing the name of the Dark Lord. Rest assured, Mr. Pendragon, we will get to the bottom of this. Where is Mr. Malfoy? Slughorn asked. In the infirmary, his own magic ended up breaking his arm. Magnus shruggingly said, as if beating the seventh year while being in first year was no big deal to him. Magnus looked around himself, at the various half-blood Slytherin or just those who were from pure blood families who didn't align themselves with pure blood theory. On the other hand, muggle-born wizards were extremely rare in Slytherin, and at the moment, only Magnus was one. Magnus saw adoration in many eyes. He internally smiled, mission successful. It was good that most students were already in their dorms at this point so the words didn't spread as fast. Dumbledore, of course, took this matter very seriously. He was in fact, notified about magic being used in the Slytherin dungeon and he was already on his way. When he heard everything from Slughorn, they headed to the infirmary. There, he saw Madame Pomfrey fixing Lucius' arm. It's nothing too serious. Just the joints are broken, I'll fix them in a jiffy, but it will hurt. She evaluated. Lucius gritted his teeth, that mood blood, how dare he, we thought he was pure, like us. Ten points taken from Slytherin for using foul language in the school. Dumbledore walked in. 
Lucius turned to Dumbledore with a face full of contempt for him, but, he decided to stay quiet. Mr. Malfoy, I need you to surrender your wand. You are a suspect in a violent crime that took place in the Slytherin common room. All testimonies have been recorded and it has been ascertained that you are the aggressor. Dumbledore demanded. I am Lucius Malfoy, heir of the noble and most ancient house of Malfoy. You cannot do this with me, not for a mere muggle-born. He argued and refused to give his wand. Dumbledore shook his head in annoyance, that was not a request, Mr. Malfoy. Also, let me remind you, the one you attacked belongs to the most respected and ancient family in the country. He is both, an Emery's and a Pendragon. Ha, huh, we don't know that. There is no proof except that talking hat's words. Lucius countered. The proof will arrive soon too. Now, hand over your wand. The Aurors will be coming here soon. Dumbledore again requested. But, seeing Lucius not moving, Dumbledore just waved his own hand and the wand from Lucius' pocket flew to him. You will get this back once the Aurors have determined its history. Dumbledore didn't stay anymore and turned around to leave. But Lucius was raging behind him. My father will hear about this. Lucius turned to Narcissa, contact my father and tell him to come here and meet me. Also, give me your wand, I must let the master know about this. That Moodblood dared to go against him. Without questioning, Narcissa did as asked. Slytherin common room. Magnus was told to not go out of there and also to not touch his broken wand. So, he just took a seat by the fireplace and played chess with his friends. You are really the best in charms. Seriously, defeating a seventh year who surprise attacked you. Ragnar commented. Magnus proudly laughed, haha, that is why I tell you to. Focusing on charms is also necessary. Because potions will not win you duels. Do you think Lucius will be suspended? Severus asked. Sigh. Likely not. His family is powerful. He might get some punishment but considering he is nearly done with his school, they won't suspend him. But, I will make sure the world knows about this. Magnus smilingly said. Man, you are seriously more Slytherin than anyone else. Ragnar distastefully said. No, I am just smart. Slytherins are egoistical backstabbers, according to the hat. Magnus argued. Eventually, an aura arrived at the school and started investigating what had happened. It was a man with a weird-looking one eye. He seemed to be a paranoid man, judging by how he was looking at everyone as if they had committed a mortal sin against him. He came to Magnus, I am from the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, or a Alastair Moody. You the Merlin kid. No, you are mistaken, Magnus replied. Moody turned to Ragnar, who he already ascertained was not the kid he was looking for because of how thin Ragnar was. Where is he? Call him, I need his statement. Ragnar awkwardly pointed to Magnus, he's the one. Moody scrutinizingly looked back at Magnus, why did you like kid? I don't remember being registered as Merlin kid in the school registers. The human species uses names for a reason, how would you feel if I called you Owlhead? Magnus argued. Moody stared at him in the eyes for a few minutes, then suddenly laughed, ha ha ha, good, good, you got some spine, boy. Chapter 40, 40. Inheritance test. Bam. Damn, look at my student. What a good kick. Arthur cheered from one of the paintings he had hijacked in the common room. Merlin also saw the whole event unfold. You did well teaching him martial arts. Merlin praised. Of course, it is better than your mumbo jumbo. Real men wield swords, dickless ones wield sticks. Arthur barked back. Merlin angrily turned to him, what did you say? Mumbo jumbo? Just keep watching. Boom. Magnus stopped the magic attack on him. Merlin looked at Arthur, you were saying something? Without magic, he would have lost his head. What the, is this Lucius boy gone mad? Arthur asked in shock. Sigh. This is what magical society had degraded to, Arthur. This is what Magnus is up against. Merlin tiredly replied. He had been in Hogwarts as a portrait ever since his death, so, he knew what was going on. Haha, ha, then Magnus will have to beat many asses. I can't wait. Arthur laughed, with pure confidence that Magnus would succeed. Magnus gave his statement to Moody. The man wanted to ask some stupid questions but he was shown his place by Magnus' quirky answers. For example, he wanted to ask Magnus about how he became the descendant when both his parents were muggles. Magnus just said that it was heavenly tribulation and he was tested by the lightning striking him 500 times when he went to see the Great Wall of China. After that, he went back to his dorm room to sleep. The next day, he was to go to Gringotts with Dumbledore to have an inheritance test. It was the weekend so he had nothing to do anyway. He would have spent his time studying. But, while he slept, in Dumbledore's office, a serious chat was taking place. That damn boy, he's too smart for his age. Moody angrily said. Calm down, Alastair. I had told you that he is smart, it was you who was out of the line. Dumbledore defended Magnus. That brat called me 50 different names in a matter of 15 minutes. His tongue is really sharp. Look at this blunder now, although I take great pleasure in seeing that Malfoy boy getting beat up, I don't want any drama right now at the ministry. And I am sure now Abraxas Malfoy is going to create a drama for his prized son. Moody said. I understand, Alastair. I have arranged for everything. Tomorrow, when Mr. Pendragon will complete his inheritance test, I will allow him to give an interview. Once the world knows that he is the true descendant, most will either not have the gall to oppose him because many will come to him to join him. Let's not ignore the reverence of Merlin, Dumbledore elaborated his plan. 
Moody nodded, yes, if I was a muggle or half-blood wizard on the streets, I would have come to him to become a follower. I hope your plan works and Abraxas does not pursue the matter. What about Lucius Malfoy? By normal rules, he should be expelled. No, I will not do that. We already know now that he is under the influence of him. If I expel him, it will only push Lucius towards him faster. Here, we can keep an eye on him. Sai you should go back now, be sure to come with enough security tomorrow. He advised. Moody got up, I know. Are you sure you don't want that boy trained? From what he did today, it's obvious that he's a prodigy in martial magic. Dumbledore didn't look at him and continued writing something on a page, no, he's too small. Letting him be affected by this dark world at such a young age would only take away his innocence. And you know what happens then. What a waste, Moody grunted and left. The next day, Magnus got ready to go out, he kept his broken wand to himself, it was tied with a lot of glue and was working at 20 per center efficiency. He met with Dumbledore in his office. From there, they were going to apparate to Diagon Alley. Mr. Pendragon, please if you will, put your hand on my arm and do not let it go. You might feel a little disoriented after reaching. Dumbledore warned him. Magnus, like the proud closet Gryffindor he was, went ahead and held on to the old man's arm. Here we go, Dumbledore signaled. Zip. While traveling, Magnus was regretting trusting this old man. His brave Gryffindor mind was not ready to face this torture on his little body. He felt as if someone had pulled out his intestines, squeezed them dry and then put them back in, followed by forcing him to drink water. Ah, mummy said never followed strangers, how could I be so foolish? He thought in his mind while trying not to throw up. Although the traveling was instantaneous, to him, it felt like an eternity. Oh why yeah, yeah, yeah. Magnus felt like he needed to vomit, but nothing would come out of his mouth. You get used to it with time. Dumbledore consoled him. Magnus shook his head, Noah, I'd prefer a broom over this anytime. Dumbledore then took out a lemon candy and gave it to Magnus. Here, eat this. It will make you feel better. If you feel good, then we will go. Where are we? Magnus asked while eating the candy from the stranger. Leaky cauldron. A room I had reserved. Dumbledore explained. After a few minutes, Magnus felt better. He conjured some water in a transfigured glass he made from a candle nearby. Dumbledore nodded seeing him perform magic so easily. He is very talented. But at least, Dumbledore had a positive view of Magnus because of his cheerful and open personality. For some reason, he always felt that if Godric Gryffindor was alive, he'd be like this. Let's go, Professor. Magnus felt better and went out of the room. As they walked to the bank, many people greeted Dumbledore. He really had a good image around the place. What does the inheritance test involve? Magnus inquired. It is complex magic. Whenever someone opens an account in Gringotts, they also let them scan you with magic to determine any heirs in the future. But inheritance tests are very strictly regulated because there could be thousands of people related to some magical families because of squibs going to Muggleside and living there. Dumbledore explained. Who controls this test? Magnus asked. Only Hogwarts or the Ministry can give permission for an inheritance test to be done. Now, your case is special, so expect a small crowd of people. The Minister for Magic will also be there. Some journalists will be there too. You should give a small interview after the test. Dumbledore suggested, not trying to force Magnus to give the interview. I'll think about it, Magnus replied. To be honest, he was feeling a bit excited right now. He felt like he was going for treasure hunting. After walking a few minutes, they finally appeared in front of the bank. Lots of aurors were there, trying to keep people and journalists away from reaching them. Ignoring them shouting Magnus' name, they quickly entered the bank. Inside, Minister for Magic Eugenia Jenkins was there with a few of her special people. It's a pleasure meeting you, Mr. Pendragon. She politely greeted him. Likewise, Minister. Magnus greeted her back. Magnus looked around and saw lots of goblins were looking at him with various expressions. As if he was a prized trophy. Many were already contemplating how much money Magnus would find in the vault. After waiting for a while and talking to the minister, a goblin in a suit came and showed them the path. Come with me, this place is not right for something so important. He requested and led the way. They came to a big office. There, a golden paper was set on the table with a small golden knife by its side. The room was decently big but there were no windows and looked to be heavily decorated with gold. It was to Magnus' liking. Gold was his favorite any time. Mr. Pendragon, please put a drop of blood on that piece of paper. The goblin instructed. Magnus did as asked. He went ahead, made a small cut on his finger with the knife that was too sharp and dropped a few drops. It looked as if his blood had dropped on water, as it got dissolved in the paper. Then, in a show of magic, names and other details started coming up on the paper. But, to everyone's shock, it did not stop after writing two names and their assets they were expecting on it. A third name was being written, meaning that this third name was the least genetically connected to him, though still connected a bit. This was the reason why inheritance tests were regulated, because any bloodline could resurface due to some long-lost squib bloodline and goblins hated when that happened. A goblin came forward and took the paper. He read it and passed it to the head of the bank. When he saw it, his eyes too went wide in shock. He looked at Magnus and spoke, Congratulations, you are just what you say. A descendant of Merlin and King Arthur. But, the third name. 